throughout the course of the Bible, God is called over 950 different names and titles, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, Father, Son, Spirit. Of these 950 names, almost 200 of them are given to God the Son. We know him namely as Jesus. His favorite nickname for himself was the Son of Man. It comes from the book of Daniel. Jesus is also called the author of salvation. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Jesus is also called the chief shepherd, the chief cornerstone, and the chief apostle, the Messiah, the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. God came down to dwell amongst men. Today we're going to be looking at why he did that. But first, let's go back to that very first Christmas. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. You see, the name Emmanuel comes from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. When the prophet prophesies, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God is not far off. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited land. This was the first census taken while Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, house of bread. Because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there is no room for them in the inn. The inn. There's two different Greek words that are translated as inn. The parable of the Good Samaritan talks about a man from Samaria walking and seeing someone who had been badly beaten and bandaged his wounds and took him to an inn. Think of it like a small hotel. But the word in here is actually a Greek word for the guest room. You see, it's very likely that Jesus was born not in a barn far away, but in a house similar to in this photograph. You see, the way that Jewish houses were set up, for many, if they had animals, the goats and the lambs were kept on the ground floor or in almost like a little sub-basement. And then up above, what we know as the upper room from when Jesus had the Last Supper, that was the main living area, and there would have been a guest room. It's likely that Mary and Joseph were with family, maybe distant cousins, maybe someone that they didn't even know. All that Joseph would have to do if he went to a relative's house and they had never met is he'd give his family lineage who his dad was, who his grandfather was, his great-grandfather, and let them know. And out of their generous hospitality, knowing that he's a family member, he would be able to stay. And apparently the guest room was full, and so Jesus was born downstairs and laid in a manger. Now there is a tradition 
um, I think it's Justin the Martyr, talks about Jesus being born in a cave. So we don't know exactly for sure. God doesn't fully tell us, but it's very likely that it was there in this house. Now, the manger that he was born in would have been hewn out of stone, not made out of wood. And its very particular purpose was to hold water, but also to hold certain lambs. You see, when that lamb that was born, that was going to be offered as a sacrifice, that lamb was wrapped in swaddling cloths in order to protect it from blemishes. And it was set in that stone manger. It's very likely that Jesus was born in the room that was set aside for the sacrificial animals, wrapped up in that cloth that was used used for the sacrificial lamb, and laid in the manger that would have housed the sacrificial lamb. Very symbolic already at his birth as to what his purpose was going to be. That he was God who came with us, and he came with a purpose. He was on a mission sent from God. A very specific reason for coming here. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to read a little bit here. And we'll get a little clue as to why God came to be with us. Philippians 2, let's read verses 5 through 11. Again, today, like last week, we're not going to be studying one particular passage. But we're going to be bouncing around a little bit. Just to, It's almost like sampling. If you've ever gone into Baskin Robbins and you can get some samples of ice cream, you're just trying to get a broad overview of what's going on there. And that's what we're doing here. We're going to get a broad look at God with us. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, you and I get to gladly bow on our knee and proclaim that he is Lord. For some who are stiff-necked and rebellious and hard-hearted, they will be forced to kneel and to bow and declare that Jesus is Lord because everyone will at some point. And it will all be done for the glory of God the Father. Jesus came to be with us, to dwell amongst humanity. Last week, we saw how Jesus came, and he celebrated, and he suffered. And when we celebrate and we suffer, we know that there's a God who is with us. We know there's a God who is with us when we are tempted and when we are lonely. We know through his Holy Spirit, he's with us today. But for now, let's take a look at nine reasons why God came to be with us. Why did he come? Well, we know that. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5. We're going to read a little bit here about God being with us. You see, when God created the world, it was good because God is good. It was perfect because God is perfect. It was a reflection of who he is. Every single act of creation, God followed up by saying it is good. And at the end, he said it is very good. And it was good but it didn't stay good. Adam and Eve chose the fruit over the Father. They turned their backs towards God and they turned themselves towards Satan. 
They reached out their hand to grab the fruit, and so that same hand would be nailed to a cross. Eve was born, taken from Adam's side. Jesus' side would be pierced. The ground would be put under a curse, and thorns and thistles would be produced, and Jesus would bear that on his head. Adam and Eve sinned at a tree, so Jesus would die on a tree. And in Genesis 3.15, we see what we call the proto evangelium It's the first gospel. God prophesies that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, but that the serpent would strike the heel. So Jesus is nailed through his feet. Verse 12 of Romans 5, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, and even over those who had not sinned. And the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, many died, much more do the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. There are those here today who will be justified and sit already justified in God's eyes, clothed with Jesus' righteousness. But there are some today who, if you were to die, you would be condemned for your sins because you might be in church, but not everyone here is in Christ. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more will those who receive the abundance of the grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. One of the nine reasons that Jesus came, and there's more than nine reasons, but one is that he is the greater Adam. Where Adam failed, we've also failed. We're like our father Adam, and some of you are like your mother Eve. We have disobeyed, we have rebelled against the high and holy God. Man tried to take the place of God, so God came in the place of man. After Adam, the world continued to grow, the flood came, and God called out a people group, starting with Abram, changing his name to Abraham. Abraham would be the father of a great nation. And that nation would be enslaved to the Egyptians and then set free through a prophet known as Moses. But the prophets eventually all died. And some of the prophets, like Moses, they rebelled and sinned. And so Jesus comes to be the greater prophet. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 20, all the way back in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And let's take a look. At Moses, and how he is the lesser prophet. Let's look at Moses, his actions here, in Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 through 11. See, there's many times that the Israelites were in need of food or in need of water, and God would supernaturally feed them and give them food, manna from heaven, And give them water to drink. But listen to this here. Verse 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation, 
and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, Listen now, you rebels. Shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came forth abundantly. And the congregation and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Those were the waters of Mirabah, because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he proved himself holy among them. Moses is given an instruction earlier on through Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, through Israel's time in the wilderness, to strike a rock and water will come out. But this time he is told not to strike the rock, but to speak. And in his anger, he strikes the rock twice, disobeying a holy God. You see, when Jesus, the rock, the solid rock that the church is built on, he was struck once for our sins when he died. But now we speak of his sacrifice and we can receive rivers of living water. Jesus didn't have to die twice or a third time. It was once that he was struck. And now we speak of that sacrifice. Moses was not to strike the rock again, but he did it twice. He rebelled. And for that, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. The great prophet who wrote the the origins of mankind, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, who was raised up from Egypt to lead the Israelites, who met with God face to face, and God spoke to him as a man speaks to friends. He wasn't a prophet good enough. We needed a greater prophet, and that would be Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to be the greater Adam, the greater prophet, but also the greater priest. Moses' brother Aaron is selected to lead the priesthood, and the Levites are selected to serve in God's house. But let's turn back a book to Leviticus chapter 10. And let's read about some of these priests. Let's read about Aaron's sons. You see, the tabernacle is built, and it's dedicated, and they're able to start sacrificing to the Lord. But we have to sacrifice to God on his terms. Leviticus 10, verse 1. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Not all the priests were great. We know that as Moses was up meeting on the mountain with God, Aaron was building the golden calf for the people. And his excuse was, we just threw gold in the fire and this calf came out. I've never seen that happen, by the way. We needed a better priest. And so we have a great high priest. Let me read to you a little bit from Hebrews chapter 4 as we see how Jesus is the greater priest. It says here in the book of Hebrews that we have a great high priest in Jesus and that he is unlike the other high priest, that he's been tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. Let me word it to you in the way that they write it. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Nadab and Abihu, they were tempted to offer strange fire, and they succumbed to that temptation to offer what God had not commanded Because God desires obedience and not sacrifice. We needed a greater priest. 
Israel was a nation unlike any other nation, led by God himself. If we wanted to look at it as a form of government, it was what we would call a theocracy. We live in a democratic republic. But they lived in a theocracy. They had God himself ruling and reigning. But the people wanted to have a king to be like the other nations. We don't want to be like other men. We want to be like God. But they wanted to be like other men, and so they asked for a king. And there came from them a man named Saul, who started off strong, but he did not end strong. To follow up after him is a man named David, someone who was a man after God's own heart. But he wasn't a perfect king. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. See, David was a man who was like all of us. He faced temptations and trials. Sometimes he succeeded and sometimes he failed. Just like Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, so was David. He saw something and he wanted it. He wanted to feel good. And then to cover up his mistakes to save his own name, he let the pride of life get in the way. He got his, one of his soldiers' wives pregnant, Bathsheba. So he tried to get that soldier to come home, Uriah, to lay and sleep with his wife. That way he might think that that's his son, his child. Uriah wouldn't lay with his wife, so David had him murdered. The prophet Nathan comes and tells David a little parable about a man with sheep. And David gets really angry until he realizes that he's the man. Verse 7, Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? By doing evil in his sight, you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and will give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. David was a king who sinned, and we needed a greater king. David's child had to die for David's sins. But we serve the God who came in the form of a child who died for our sins. He is the greater king. We needed a greater Adam, a greater prophet, a greater priest, and a greater king. We also needed someone to fulfill the law. The law was given through Moses. And the law was all about man's heart. And there's different aspects to the law. There's the ceremonial law. There's the moral law. But Jesus comes to fulfill the law. During the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives us a little clue as to why he was here, why he came to this earth, why God became flesh to dwell and tabernacle amongst us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law 
until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, praise God that we are clothed with Jesus' righteousness and we don't have to get into heaven by our own works righteousness. But Jesus comes to fulfill the law. All the law he held perfectly. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never took God's name in vain. Jesus followed these laws until he started that new covenant. When he turned water into wine and showed us that something new was coming. God came to be with us to fulfill the law. The law was like a mirror to show us what was wrong with us. In the New Testament, Paul calls it the, that it was our schoolmaster. It was to teach us and to lead us and guide us towards the master. But the law could not fix our problem. The law just showed us that we had a problem. As one person said, the mirror can reveal that you might have something in your teeth, but you don't take the mirror off the wall and use it as a toothpick. It shows you the problem, but it's not the solution. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. God came to be with us to be our example, to be the model human being, to show us the life that Adam could not have lived because he sinned. To show us godly character. Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Elsewhere Paul says imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ is the ultimate example. Those wristbands that were popular years ago weren't just a little fad. What would Jesus do? But that's something for us to think about. How would God respond in our situations? What would God do if he was angry with his boss? What would God do if he was driving down the road and some guy behind him had bright headlights? What would God do if he's cut off in traffic? What would God do if his family members burned him? How would he respond? And how do we respond in a Christ-like manner? He's the ultimate example. Let's turn to John chapter 14. God came to be with us to reveal God the Father. If you read the book of 1 John, you'll see the Father heart of God. Jesus comes to reveal God the Father to us through his actions and through his words. Jesus repeated over and over again that what he came to do was to fulfill the commandments of the Father, to speak the words the Father gave him, to bring glory and honor to the Father. It's a great relationship that the Trinity has. The Son giving glory and honor to the Father, the Father putting that back onto the Son and giving the Son the church as a bride and the Spirit. The Son giving us the Spirit and the Spirit opening our eyes back to the Son who points us back to the Father. It's all very loving in the Trinity. John chapter 14, verse 6. Then Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. How have we seen the Father? Elsewhere, Jesus says no one has seen the Father except for the one that has been begotten from the Father because the Father is not flesh and blood but spirit. But we see him because if we've seen Jesus, we know the heart of the Father. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. God came to be with us to reveal to us the heart of the Father. Flip over to John, 1 John, chapter 2. And as you're going there, I'm going to read a verse from Colossians. Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. 1 John chapter 2. God comes to be with us so he can atone for our sins, so he can pay the penalty for our sins. When someone sins, he earns what sin pays, which is death. That is spiritual death, physical death, and eternal death in hell. But Jesus comes to give us eternal life, a new body in heaven, and spiritual life. 1 John 2, verse 2 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Flip the page over to 1 John chapter 4. Verse 10 says, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, the atonement the price that needed to be paid for our sin debt to set us free. And lastly, God came to be with us to redeem us. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Actually, let's start reading in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he has purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. We can have peace with God and others because God came to be with us. He came to be the greater Adam, the greater prophet, the greater priest, the greater king, to reveal God the Father to us, to fulfill the law to save us, to redeem us. And now we can walk in newness of life, being sanctified and made holy each and every day, growing closer to him, knowing that God is with us. For James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. It's us who stray. We need to be made aware of his presence. 
And God didn't leave us as orphans. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to convict us of sin, to comfort us, lead us, and guide us, and teach us. God is with us. He's with us today. He's in our midst. He heard us sing praises. He heard us read his word. And he's going to hear us continue to sing and praise him. What a great God we have in Jesus. He's not like those false gods made out of wood and stone where half of the idol is made out of wood and the other half is thrown in to the fire to cook food. He's not like the gods of our day of social media and work and television and sports. He's far greater and far better than all those things. A God who humbled himself to be born in the likeness of men, becoming as a servant, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, that we might come alive with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Thank you that you're just a great God, that we could just continue to learn about you and be amazed by the beauty of who you are. God, I pray that today we would just have our eyes open more and more to the beauty and the splendor of your love and your grace and who you are. Thank you for coming down to this earth, being born as a man, to experience life, to grow up, to work, to preach, to teach, to make friends, to have enemies, to be tempted in every way as we are, yet to be without sin, to fulfill the law, to fulfill where we fall short. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, God. Thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit which grows in us the fruits of the Spirit, that we can have a love for you and others, that we can have joy in the midst of trials, and that we can have peace no matter our circumstances. Thank you, God, for the gifts that you've given us. In your perfect holy name, amen.